Welcome to Side Effects. Effect versus affect. It's hard to know the difference. At McGowan Braybender, our goal is to provoke you to think differently about employee benefits, your employees, and the status quo. That's why it's called Side Effects with an A. Join me, Kenzie McEvely, an MB co-host and one of the industry's brightest guests to dive deep into the process of good employee benefits. Let's get started. In the complicated world of health insurance, we look to the experts for guidance and expertise. Today, we welcome Ryan Barbieri, partner and vice president of employee benefit sales at M3 Insurance based out of Wisconsin. He earned his Bachelor of Business Administration in Marketing and Management from Wisconsin Lutheran College and has nearly two decades of success in the insurance and financial services profession. M3 is an insurance and financial services firm specializing in the areas of property and casualty, employee benefits, and corporate retirement planning. M3 is a member of the equity-owned partnership C2 Solutions along with McGowan Braybender. C2 Solutions is a collaborative group that was formed to create and deliver insurance solutions to clients. Our podcast will focus on the topic, direct contracting, what it is, who uses it, and why more employers are investigating it as an option. Direct contracting presents potential cost savings, but also requires thorough analysis and understanding. After this episode, maybe it's the collaboration between employers and healthcare providers that's right for your organization. Without further delay, let's welcome Ryan to the show. Hello, everyone. Anne-Marie, thank you for joining me as a co-host today. How are you? Yes, thank you for having me. I'm great. Perfect. And Ryan, thank you so much for being here. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's great to see you both. Yeah. I have to say on the uh, on the intro, two decades in the insurance industry, <laughs> I, I don't feel that old. Well, you, <laughs> you don't, don't look that nope, old. You don't look that old at all. You look well, great. Thank you. So thanks for, for joining us today, Ryan. We're very excited to talk with you. And um, we've been working together for a while now, you and I, and I won't tell you how many decades I've been in the industry because then we'll all feel, you'll all feel much younger. Uh, but Kenzie touched on our partnership with M3 and C2. And I'm wondering if you can just break that down a little further for our listeners. Yeah, no, would love to. And um, first and foremost, thanks for having me on the show. I'm a huge fan of Side Effects. You guys do such a great job, and uh, it's it's an honor and a pleasure to be be on here and sharing some thoughts. Um, C2. So I would say first and foremost, our six C2 partners um, we're friends, and you know many of us have been partners and doing business together for uh, a long time, a lot of years mm -hmm. uh, from a business perspective. Yeah, I think what we really strive for within C2 and with our partnership is uh, to allow each of our firms, which are you know private, independent, and like-minded, uh, to find opportunities to collaborate. Uh, so we're you know bigger and stronger together. Right. Yep. That's what we love about it. Right. Doing great things for our clients and the markets we serve. C2 is a very cool. When I first joined MB, I I had no idea, and I'm like, this is the coolest thing I've heard of. Just other companies like us, we want to collaborate and get information and ideas. And it's nice to have an M3 C2 partner with us today. Um, so Ryan, the main point of the podcast today is to talk about direct contracting, which we like to think you're an expert in. So I would like to admit being in the marketing department, I had to do a lot of Googling <laughs> to realize what this meant in the health insurance field. So for our listeners and for myself, can you explain what is direct contracting? Yeah, so direct contracting has really been around for uh, a lot of years. And, you know, when you go back where it started, um, probably, you know, three, three decades ago, maybe even more, um, you had large manufacturers primarily uh, that had a single location, so densely populated workforce. Um, and in their community, they would identify a provider that, that wanted to partner uh, and they basically struck up a deal. Um, so again, that was reserved in the past for the largest of employers. But I think more recently, um, let's say in the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen more types of direct contracts pop up mm -hmm. that allow for maybe more middle market employers um, to participate uh, and find different ways to manage their healthcare spend. Yeah, so just a, a maybe a step back. I mean, direct contracting versus what most employers do today, right? So most employers are um, accessing a network or a contract through a carrier. 
like one of the large Blue Cross, United, Aetna, um, Cigna type networks, right? So the direct contracting cuts that out, right? It's employer directly to the provider. And so yeah, no, you're exactly right. And, and there's a lot of different types of direct contracts. So I, I had mentioned contracting with directly with a provider delivery system, i.e. a hospital and their clinics. Mm -hmm. But I think when you take a look at other types of direct contracts today, um, on-site clinics, you have orthopedic bundles, uh, physical therapy, um, even I would throw medical tourism or, you know, pharmacy tourism in that, which is, you know, really one of the more recent trends that we're seeing. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be global, right? You don't have to take all of your spend and place it with one health system or one provider um, or bring it all on site. It, it can be piecemealed or parceled out or you can take your highest cost or the, you know, looking for quality. So we keep hearing about direct contracting and the growth in it. You mentioned it yourself in the last 10 or 15 years. So what do you think is causing this interest? Maybe the top one or two things that, that's really causing this to come down to the middle market and to really be looked at and evaluated. Well, I think the biggest thing on why, you know, employers look at it in the first place is think about healthcare spend and employee benefit spend. Mm -hmm. It's generally the second highest spend that any business has. And oh, by the way, it's going up at an average of seven, eight, nine percent, depending upon which area of the country you're in. So I think the first reason why employers might, you know, look at direct contracting as an opportunity is, is to create a more sustainable health plan and control costs. Now, mm -hmm. with that being said, I think once you dig into it, and if, if you're uh, a data junkie like me and a lot of your consultants and our consultants, right. um, I think there's a lot of other opportunities that stem from it. So as an example, um, on-site clinics or direct contracts with providers offer up an opportunity to use the data analytics that we have to identify uh, really targeted points of intervention, like around chronic condition management or taking our wellness program to the next level. And I think you can also take a look at um, something we call social determinants of health, right? So mm -hmm. um, low income workers may have affordability issues. Uh, rural employees that live in a rural area versus urban may have an access issue. Right. So direct contracts can solve for some of those things. So it's not just about the employer cost here. I mean, really almost everything you said is about improving the member experience and improving the member health, right? Yeah, exactly. So Ryan, you just mentioned um, medical tourism and pharmacy tourism. Can you break down what does that mean? Yeah, basically what it means is if you can find a high, a high quality provider at a lower cost in another country to have a procedure done or to go fill a prescription, um, some employers choose to actually send that individual down uh, maybe over a couple of days or over a weekend uh, to have the procedure done or to fill the prescription. Mm -hmm. We're now, even seeing that domestic not, a little bit, right? Even some domestic. Yeah, we're even seeing that. The, absolutely. There's some of that happening domestically, uh, globally and internationally. Um, it's certainly not the norm, non-traditional approach, but it's happening. Right. Interesting. So what is the DNA of a client that would most likely use direct contracting? Are they self-funded? What are the different degrees of people using it? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that, you know, would, would um, you know, kind of characterize the profile. One is generally self-funded, right? Um, because, yeah. you know, you have more flexibility as a self-funded employer to tailor the program and, and um, how that connects with needs of your employees. Um, I think another one is, you know, industry to some degree. So we see a lot of success with manufacturing because there's other tentacles of direct contracts that can apply to a manufacturer, um, you know, like pre-employment screenings and maybe even some workers' compensation uh, opportunities. Right. And um, large and populations of people in, in one space, oftentimes because manufacturing requires people to be um, at the manufacturing site in most cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was the third point I was going to make, Anne-Marie. And I think sorry, also- Ryan. <laughs> no, that's okay. I told you I was going to interrupt you. And, and in addition to that dense population, Anne-Marie, I would also say, I mean, in some areas where there's really competitive provider systems, mm -hmm. um, I think that's also can help in, you know, negotiating those deals or making it a, a successful venture. 
Yeah. So, I mean, again, you've, you've touched on a number of things. So the medical tourism, um, the, the con, uh, the, the clinics on site, near site, um, you know, the fact that it can go across wellness and occupational health, um, there's just so many opportunities and as you said many many layers to um, direct contracting um, talk a little bit about um, what we were speaking about a moment ago which is how does this benefit all the different stakeholders so you've got the employer um, you've got the employee and their experience you've got the healthcare delivery providers um, or those clinicians in that space maybe talk about um, how this benefits each of those those folks yeah, you bet. So you identified the three main stakeholders. Um, I completely agree with those. So the the employer, um, you know, I think uh, there's an opportunity to lower y- your unit cost of care, which I think is one you know main benefit for an employer. Um, and you do that by basically creating steerage um, mm-hmm. to that provider delivery system, um, and you know they're going to pick up volume in exchange for that. Um, I think the other thing that the employer gains, however, is you can now begin to uh, direct how that provider engages with employees based upon what we feel our needs. So maybe it's chronic condition management or whatever the case may be. Um, And then the last employer benefit is, you know, that not every provider is, you know, uh, created equally. Um, Some are higher quality and lower cost than others. Right. And those are the ones that we want to certainly maximize. Um, from an employee perspective, you know, I touched on it before. I mean, there's a there's an affordability and an access opportunity mm-hmm. that we can more directly meet the needs of our employees. And I think we can also, again, tailor uh, the types of services that are offered to our employees um, to really identify uh, what they need and maybe how it fits into you know our culture. Um, and and then lastly, the provider system. So. Uh, providers love to partner with employers Mm -hmm. and uh, you know selfishly for them it's a large population of potential patients Um, but you know providers are really wired to help the community and engage in the community and improve the health and well-being of the community and what a great opportunity uh, to partner with an employer to help accomplish that overarching goal Um, but from a business perspective of course if we can you know, drive more people to them and integrate more care, it makes their outcomes even better. Right. Now, you said something that I'm going to go back to um, about cost and quality. But before I do that, I want to uh, touch on something else you said, which is in, uh, providers love to partner with employers. The issue is employers don't really know that, right? Because they haven't had an opportunity to talk to the providers because they've been purchasing their coverage and insurance through a third party, like one of these health plans that we just talked about. So bringing them together and letting them talk to each other um, over the course of the last 10 years has been a really enlightening um, situation for most of them, right? They get to hear what one another needs and wants. And um, I say this tongue in cheek, but imagine if you had to call your cable company to talk to them about your cell phone bill. I mean, that's kind of what we've asked people to do, right? Uh, Both are very complicated and, and one doesn't know much about the other. And so we've created this, um, this healthcare in this in this in the United States, so that employers really have been in the dark about how all of that works. So now we've opened these floodgates. We've introduced them to one another. And um, I'm going to take you back to the question I had, which was about data and data analytics, because you talked about cost and quality. And um, I'd like you just to touch on that a little bit more: the relationship of cost and quality and how how employers can determine if they're going to enter into some of these direct contracts. Um, how do I know that I'm getting better quality for my employees, which is really what they're after, right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, qu- quality is the harder one sometimes to, to drive to because a, a low cost for a particular procedure doesn't necessarily mean that it's the lowest quality. Um, sometimes the higher cost provider is actually providing the highest quality. And we can measure that through things like readmissions and um, how many additional physical therapy visits are going to happen post-op, as an example. So um, it, it's hard to aggregate all of that information. Um, mm-hmm. Now, there are, you know, there are national quality metrics and even you know, some states aggregate their hospital quality metrics 
Um, so the data is out there and just depending upon what state you're in, uh, you can you can harvest some of that information. I think when we take a look at um, the cost quality equation, um, a lot of times what we take a look at is, uh, you know, Medicare. So you can take a look at Medicare uh, and how are providers charging as a percentage of Medicare. And that that's how you can oftentimes get the cost piece and then go to other areas to get the quality piece. There are also some uh, third party uh, platforms that will aggregate some of that. Um, Garner Health is an example is one mm -hmm. that, you know, that we've done some work with. Um, and, you know, it's a great opportunity to put that information in the hands of uh, your members or, or the employees. Right. So it's not exactly um, one place and it's going to tell us everything, right? That'd be too easy. Um, but the data is there and working hard to understand it and making sure that um, you know what type of contract you're entering into or that you understand the type of care delivery um, your employees are going to get. It's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Working together, it's yeah. possible. Yep. And on this analytics track here, so if direct contracting is sex successful, what is the typical return on investment or cost avoidance? What, how do you guys measure it and, and what do you expect? Yeah, I mean, the proverbial ROI, right? I mean, every CFO wants to know what are we getting out of this? Mm -hmm. um, and, of you know, when we're, talk, when we're talking about um, measuring the cost avoidance on claims that don't occur, that's really hard to do. Right. Um, now, I think what you, what you do have an opportunity in the area of direct contracting, there's two different buckets that you can look at. One, you can identify an ROI when you're shifting costs. Let me use primary care as an example. So if we establish an on-site clinic and the unit cost of a visit is $50 versus the average in the area of $150 or $175, well, we know that every visit that we shift from a traditional uh, provider system or primary care doc to our on-site clinic is saving $100, right? right? or the same sort of thing with urgent care for maybe a throat swab, a strep test or something of that nature. So um, we, we can get that data and we can measure that. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you take a look at how to measure what I would call value on our investment, um, that's identifying trends. And one of the things that we love to do is take a look at, let's say chronic condition management. So are we closing our gaps in care? Um, are we lowering the overall risk for a particular disease state? Um, while we can't tie that out to an actual actual dollar amount ROI, we do know that there's some financial value, but what we're doing is we're accomplishing the, the, the overarching goal of improving the overall health of our population, mm -hmm. right? And there's tremendous value in that. Um, the last thing that I'll say real quick, it, tying this back to COVID, I think in data, we can also identify some, some negative trends. So let me give you an example. Um, primary care visits, age-appropriate screenings, in particular mammograms and PSA tests for mm -hmm. uh, breast cancer and for prostate cancer have absolutely tanked yeah, because yeah. people are not comfortable going into a, provider, uh, a traditional provider center. So here's a great example of a really easy direct contract. Um, employers or consultants can call up a local provider system and um, ask them to deploy their mobile uh, mammography van, as right. an example, and take that out to the employer. That's a direct contract. Mm -hmm. And we can identify that opportunity through negative trends in our data, like not going out and getting your screenings. Yeah. And I think we're going to continue to see that throughout this year and even in, in leading into next year, because those preventive visits, while we've been working on getting those, you know, those numbers up really high over the last 10 or 15 years, you know, mm -hmm. encouraging everyone to get those um, required tests and checks at certain intervals and certain ages, which we will not speak about, um, <laughs> that really did fall off. And so we're, uh, you know, uh, trying to avoid those claims that are perhaps coming in the future because um, uh, early prevention didn't take place. So really, really good point. Um, so talk, talk to me for a minute about how direct contracting works with medical carriers. I mean, we've talked about different types of direct contracting, but in other words, um, does it replace the medical carrier? Um, are there some that, that it doesn't work very well with, or is there certain services where it's a really good fit and it would be you know, widely available? What's been your experience? Yeah, so a direct contract is typically not going to completely replace a traditional health insurance carrier. So when we talk about 
uh, the profile of, of an employer, right? So self-funding is one of the things that, that we identified. So um, those employers will still have a third party administer, administrator that will administer their claims. Um, you'll still have a traditional network in place, right? That gives mm -hmm. you broad access to providers. We need that. Um, and so your direct contracts, whether they be in orthopedics or bundled services or uh, on-site clinics or whatever the case may be, will generally speaking, sit on the side of that. Um, now, depending upon our carrier and the type of arrangement, that TPA, third-party administrator, might mm -hmm. still adjudicate the claims and process the claims. Um, some of them uh, might, some of the direct contracts may require, um, you know, payment directly to, you know, the provider from the employer. So each one is going to be a little bit different. And I would also say it's state dependent too, right? right. Um, there's different sorts of insurance companies and, and uh, things like that in each state that are going to need to be taken into consideration. Yeah. So you mentioned um, that, that some of the third party administrators would, would still pay the claims. And in some cases, the employer might have to pay it directly. Um, uh, you know, talk a little bit more about what other things uh, employers should consider. I mean, is there any, are there any other issues to consider when going to direct contracting aside from obviously the payment of it's really important, the, the, the flow of dollars. Um, what other things should they be considering? Well, I think one thing important to put out there is the fact that, I mean, we're adding another layer of complexity to the health plan. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, you know, we might be from an in perspective, uh, we might making access easier and it more affordable and it might actually be sim more a more simple arrangement for an employee um but not for the employer because we we have one more relationship that we need to manage right so um, i think you also yeah exactly and you know if we're bringing some of these services on site um you also have to think about the fact now that maybe we have a clinic uh, in our building. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that looks different and there are different clean, cleanliness standards and you need to think about privacy if people are going in. So, um, again, I, I wouldn't say that these are items that you need to be worried about, um, but certainly need to consider them. And does that fit your culture? Does it fit your bandwidth and running a business? Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those sorts of things. Yeah. So the administrative side, being mindful, being planful, um, obviously you, you want it to work. So you don't want to rush into putting anything in there that you're not ready to administer or support. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And I think the biggest, I think the biggest piece too, Anne-Marie is, you know, um, are, do we as an employer uh, feel like we're ready to tackle something that's non-traditional in nature? Because mm -hmm. again, um, I love these ideas of direct contracts and I love what they can do for employees uh, and, and their health. Um, but it, it, it's different. Right. Just a question, Ryan, when you mentioned culture and how, if it fit your culture, that kind of intrigued me. What Do you have any examples of that, of groups that would bring it in because it fits their culture? Yeah. So um, we have uh, we have a customer here in Wisconsin. Um, they, they're in the uh, outdoor recreation business, so they manufacture outdoor recreation equipment. And it's a very, very active culture, and they do a lot of things on site at their location, like... Uh, providing um, lunch service to their employees and very dynamic wellness offerings. They have uh, different recreation trails for, you know, things like biking and hiking and skiing on their premises. Mm -hmm. um, so part of their culture is, you know, bringing a lot of these different sorts of resources to their employees as an added enhancement to their benefit, right? So along with that and coupled in with that, um, they have a very dynamic wellness offering that's, you know, what I would say on the cutting edge of population health management. So uh, where they'll use some of their on-site offerings to help promote coaching opportunities and, and things like that. Um, so that's an example of how maybe a non-traditional medical offering kind of fits in with their culture of enhanced benefits by bringing things to the workplace. Yeah, it's a really good point. And, you know, I find that when we have strategic conversations with employers and we, we look at their mission and vision statement that's normally on their walls when we come through the lobby and then we talk to them about their benefits, um, there hasn't always been 
a, a conscious thought about does the mission and vision of our company match up with the benefits that we're delivering to our employees. Um, that that connection's being made more so now than in the past. But I mean, just going back even a couple of years ago, employers were not thinking about it in that way. Um, so you bring a very good point up, Kenzie and, and Ryan, thank you for that description, is that um, do our benefits match what we're trying to do and who we say we are as an employer? Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. I do think of Mago and Braybender in that aspect where we, we focus a lot on family and we have a lot of awesome family benefits mm -hmm. in daycare, adoption, all that stuff. So I think we're fitting our culture pretty well. <laughs> yes, yes, I think so too. So Ryan, when I know we kind of touched on this earlier. When we discuss who would be using direct contracting, what setting is it most likely to take place? And we talked about larger groups, self-funded groups. Can you Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think you you hit uh, a couple of those, um, you know, one one area that I might focus in on when you take a look at, okay, you know, larger employers generally having um, a, a significant portion of their population, if not all of their population in a location. Um, but I think, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the community in which, you know, you may be in, right? So, if you have a community that has um, maybe two high cost uh, provider systems, as an mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. um, that might be a catalyst to talk about bringing a third party, what I sometimes refer to as a dock in a box, uh, a third like party that. on site on site clinic, right? So it's not a part of the community healthcare system that's you know down the street. Um, it's a it's a third party, right? And there's a number of them that are out there. And um, that's a way for us to, I think, hold maybe some of those providers in, in the local community accountable um, to the fact that they're higher cost maybe than what we feel they should be. Yeah. And I mean, that brings up a really good point. I mean, healthcare is still very regional, very regional. We could go, you know, 50 miles down the road and see a completely different setup and scenario um, where one community might have two primary systems, one might have five. Um, it definitely changes the dynamics and the cost structure in those particular spaces. And introducing, you know, a, a third party to that um, introduces a little bit of competition, right, for services and um, could potentially bring lower cost, better quality, and better access to the members. So um, really, really good point. So let's just say, okay, we're ready. We've explored this. We understand the cost and quality metrics our culture fits, we're a self-funded employer, we're ready to do this. Check all the boxes. Yep, check, 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 check. Now what? What do we do? What's the process? Like, um, you, you know, how, do, how does it work? How long does it take? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, well, the first thing that I would say is anytime you're entering into some sort of non-traditional direct contract arrangement, um, I think setting the expectation that this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? Mm -hmm. This is not a short-term silver bullet type of fix. What we're doing is we're really putting something in place to create sustainability over the long term. Um, but when you take a look at the process, so everything that you said before and identifying the, the opportunity that's in front of us, I will put that in the first bucket of um, data analysis mm -hmm. and opportunity analysis, right? So um, data analytics is the foundation of, of what we do. And I know you, you guys uh, do a lot of that. We, have, um, we use the same data analytics platform that's foundational. Um, I think the second step then is to identify what's the low, lowest hanging fruit, right? So where can we get the most uh, most juice out of the squeeze? And um, understanding that contracting with a full healthcare system with multiple hospitals and multiple clinics is harder than maybe identifying an on-site clinic opportunity or maybe even something as simple as uh, working with a, a physical therapist down the road to provide some, you know, very specific uh, opportunities. So, identifying what's the easiest for us to do, and where can we, you know, identify the the best opportunity. Right. From there, we, I don't where know. Where can we get some wins, right? Where can we get some wins and get the employees used to it? We can show some ROI related to it. No, absolutely. And I think after those, you know, those two steps, I mean, it, it's a matter of sitting down and having the conversation and you know not all providers are going to have sort of a canned direct contract process so 
you know, we might be talking and negotiating on, you know, what are the fees going to be for certain services? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's contracts that need to, you know, need to uh, be executed and things of that nature. Um, what we like to do, especially when there's a third party provider that we're utilizing, like for onsite clinic services, we love to give them access to our data analytics platform, because we feel like that's the most holistic view of chronic condition on a member specific level and right. where gaps in care provide. So it allows the clinician to do uh, more holistic work, right? Uh, so that's a, a process and integration. And then I would say the last step after you have it in place is you need to measure it. Um, right. Did it accomplish what we set out to do? Right. Should we keep doing it? Should we do more of it? Should we stop doing it? Um, definitely looking at, you know, how is it, how is it working for the employer, for the employees, and then for those providers that are providing that direct care. Um, I'll give just a quick example, our um, local uh, hospital, children's hospital in the area here. You keep using the word bundled, and so I, I'll just maybe give an example of that. So they, they have put together a bundle for um, hernia, for ear tubes. Um, a couple of really common services that kids need on a routine basis. They've packaged it and they've offered a direct contract to employers for those routine services um, versus having it be a different price depending on the facility or where it's done or which doctor or what have you, which is what was happening before. So um, that's just an example of, of something that's happening in our, our geography. So Ryan, as we are nearing the end of this podcast, how do you think drug contracting will continue to evolve? Do you think it will keep growing? Could it be replaced with something? Or will people just start doing more bundled services like Anne-Marie just mentioned? Yeah, I think elements of direct contracting will continue to evolve. And, you know, again, I'll come back to the fact that, you know, healthcare um, healthcare in the United States, we're incredibly blessed from the standpoint that, you know, healthcare quality in the United States is amazing. Mm -hmm. And yes. innovation is, you know, we are tip of the spear in terms of innovations, but um, that comes at a high cost. Right. And, you know, there, there uh, something needs to happen, something needs to change. And until that happens or changes, employers are gonna, gonna continue uh, to push us as consultants, right? and the provider delivery systems to think differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's gonna be the catalyst for continued uh, direct contracts, whether those are the direct contracts that we see today or uh, an evolution into a more virtual type of environment, which is beginning to happen as well. Right, yes. And I think one la last comment I guess I'll make on the, the term or word direct contract is, I think that folks think of it meaning something very specific um, and something very scary and something very permanent and something that's really for those large employers. And what you've just shared with us today and uncovered is that um, direct contracting is a very large um, overarching theme that can mean something very simple, something very useful to a workforce and something that um, employers, um, even down to 100 lives as a self-funded employer, um, can take advantage of. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and uh, appreciate you sharing your thoughts on direct contracting with us today, Ryan. Yeah, I just really appreciate the, the invitation to join you on your podcast. You guys do such good work and um, thank you again for you know, your partnership uh, and your friendship. And I just, I just look forward to us continuing that for many years into the future together as, as our companies evolve. We're so glad we have you as a side effects super fan, Ryan. If any of our listeners want to get a hold of you or M3, how can they contact you? Yeah, so uh, my contact information is on uh, our M3 website. It's uh, www.m3ins.com, um, and uh, yeah, we love to uh, we love to talk to folks that are looking to move the needle. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for joining us on Side Effects. If you have any questions or topic recommendations, you can email me at Kenzie at HealthierBirthdays.com. Or you can email me at Ann at HealthierBirthdays.com. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time on Side Effects. Thanks, everyone.